Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now, without further ado, let's go! So this happened some ways back, around when the pandemic was brand new and everyone and their mother was talking up on literally anything and everything in a panic. I work in a county jail night shift at that. I don't need to tell you that dealing with inmates for an entire night can be the stuff of nightmares. Especially when a lot of them are spoiled brats like the ones I deal with. Three Texas-sized meals a day and TV in every cell slash tank. So when I get off work, I'm in no mood for anyone's bullcrap. The shift was particularly stressful on account of a few DYIs who were so very unhappy to have been brought to jail. It was also the end of the month when I'm paid, so as is custom for me, I slipped down to the Bookshire Brothers in town to stock up. Mostly on the DiGiorno pizzas as they go on sale on Saturdays and if neither me nor the wife want to cook or go out, that's our go-to. I'm wearing a black baggy coat to cover my uniform shirt because some people can't see the difference between a correctional officer and a cop slash deputy, and I would rather not be put in a situation given all the stories of terrible cops you see, and the plain black cloth face mask. Now, I'm a thoughtful individual. Many places were limiting how much you could grab, so I asked if there was a limit on pizzas beforehand. She said there was not, and I proceeded down the aisle, crammed full of frozen pizzas, mind you. And I started loading up. I step away to grab some things on another aisle and come back to a wild Karen in its most natural state rifling through my basket and grabbing things here and there. For a moment, I am blinded by the sheer majesty, audacity of this sight. And if I had a camera, as well as a British accent, I may have narrated the whole scene. She had giant glasses and some weird mix of pajama pants and a shirt, neither of which were flattering on her figure, I should say. And the face that to this day makes me think of a goblin shark if it somehow bit into something sour. I am, however, a very tired and cranky Texan, and the conversation proceeds as thus. Can I help you, ma'am? We're in a pandemic, and it isn't right for you to be stocking up on so much at the expense of others. Don't be a selfish piece of crap. The shelves around us are crammed full of pizzas, and I already ensured there wouldn't be a problem. But okay. The woman is literally snatching things from my cart and putting them in hers. Stop going through my cart and put back what you already took out, ma'am. I'm allowed to buy as many pizzas as I like. And that's when my grocery safari took a dangerous route. This very entitled and snotty woman and her nasally voice proceeds to march up to me and jab her bony finger into my chest repeatedly. Don't you talk to me like that. I can get you banned from this freaking store in an instant. My patience is already shot to hell, so I casually move past her. I am six feet and she wasn't anywhere close. And I proceed to take my things back. Woman loses her ever-loving mind and starts screeching, slapping my back, clown at me. And at some point, her husband comes running over and proceeds to start yelling at me and trying to push and shove me. We've gained an audience and eventually have her body blocking the both of them from my guard and keeping my arms raised defensively, the manager and a few workers show up. Karen proceeds to give the usual story of this and that, painting me as some thug who started taking from her basket and threatened to physically harm her. I corrected her, gave my side of it, and she's corrected by the manager that there was no limit on the items I was buying. They both want assault charges pressed on me regardless, and the police get cold, to which I finally snap and cast the both of them out. And then it happened. This brave, foolish little screeching which snatches my mask off my face and spits on it before tossing it to the ground. By this point, an actual deputy who was at the store came walking up. Again, the same story, but the deputy, one I know, is looking at me for my side of it. And what did I do? I removed my jacket showing off my XXX County Sheriff's Office shirt. 
The deputies and jailers have the same uniform, and I crossed my arms. The couple had quite the oh no moment, and you could see the regret and panic forming rapidly on their faces. I give my side of the story and clarify that I want the cameras checked and pointed upward to where this whole mess was in clear view of one and make clear that I will be pressing charges for assault of a public servant and whatever else I could stick to them. The woman begins blubbering, shoving everything she can back into my basket and screaming about how sorry she was and how it was all a big misunderstanding. The husband is stammering apologies left and right, trying to take my hand to try and plead with me, I guess. Don't know, jerked my arm back and waited as the footage was reviewed, and both of them were cuffed. The manager gave me a discount and I went on my merry way. The best part? I saw them in holding when I came in for my shift that day. They didn't get the public servant charge because I was off duty but they still had quite a fine for everything else they got. I also still see them around town often. They have yet to make eye contact with me and always vanish the minute we're anywhere in the same general area in this tiny little town. It amuses me every single time. July of 2002. When I was 16, our neighbor who was a prat with a capital C decided she wanted to have satellite TV installed. The house she lived in had a very small yard in the back, smaller in the front, and the fence that my mother had installed a couple of years ago was only about 5 yards from her side door. The only place the satellite could be installed was on the back of the house, but there was no way the vehicles could make it to her backyard. So, in her infinite wisdom, Brad decided to have them tear down our fence and drive over our property to get to her backyard. This starts a huge fight between her and my mother. Brad tries to claim that my mom built a fence too close to her house anyway, and mom produced a land description to prove the fence was in the right spot. Turns out they were both wrong. We knew the woman had built her house too close to the property line, but it seems it was closer than we thought. She was only feet from the line. That fence should have been almost touching the side of her house. Her uncle was a deputy mayor of our small town, around two southern population, and she tried to get him involved. Nothing came out of it, so we thought it was over. Late September, early October that same year, while I was in school, mom was taking a shower when our two dogs alerted her to someone at the door. She put on a bathrobe and went to see the police chief and about a dozen officers on our lawn, claiming they had been tipped off to a meth lab on the property and demanded to be allowed to search. Mom realized that Pratt had to have been the one to call them, as the chief of police was known to be a personal friend to her family. Mom demanded the search warrant and they didn't have one, which triggered several hours of them refusing to leave until they searched the property. This all started around 9 or 10 in the morning, nearing 3 p.m. Mom tells him she needs to pick me up from school and take me to her mother's house because I couldn't drive her. They refuse to move their vehicles to let her leave and say it's fine. They will send a squad car to pick me up, which would have just humiliated me. Mom calls her lawyer who informs her that if they don't produce a warrant to tell them to leave. So the chief tells her if he goes for a warrant, he will tell whoever issues him that he can smell meth on the property and will be given a warrant for anything he asks for. He will then return, kick our door out of the frame and if our dogs even look at him for that, he will shoot both of them and kill them. Yes, he actually said that to my mother. Mom called grandma to pick me up from school nearly an hour after it lit out and let the police search the house. They found my mom's gun safe. This safe was one of those made of steel with a curricular lock, kind of like on a soda machine and had the key sitting on top of it. Before anyone says how unsafe it is, it was just my mom and stepdad in the house most of the time. I was an only child and lived with my grandparents and only visited on weekends. And mom kept the door to her room locked with a key. There was no way anyone under 18 was getting near her guns. The cops proceeded to take a crowbar and pry the safe open. 
Even though the key is right there, and it's clearly it's the key to the safe. They then take the guns outside and divide them up. They even took my mom's handgun, which she had a concealed carry permit for. This continued for hours until mom relented and opened my stepdad's shop building. He was using it to house his motorcycle while he slowly restored it from a wreck about 15 years before. They barely got over the threshold of the door before screaming meth lab and pointed at the cleaning agents and bottles that were all scooted together. Nothing else. No other signs of meth other than some cleaning agents and empty mason jars sitting near one another. They brought out heavy spot lamps and more coughs. By one in the morning, my mother had been sitting outside in the cool fall weather in nothing but a bathrobe this entire time. They claimed to have found the marijuana plant behind our six foot tall privacy fence that kept people from seeing us in our hot tub. When I found out about this, I was upset. I was 16 and went to school in a small town. Everyone would know about it. The next day, Saturday, I was piddling around on the internet when a friend messaged me to ask what had happened and why was my mother in jail. My mother was not in jail. Friend says, my mom said it's on the news right now. Mama, stepdad are sitting in jail this weekend, was out bond for running the largest drunk den in your town's history. When mom called the news to ask them why they had run that story without checking, they apologized and said they had been contacted by the town police and were told to run the story. The next night, they issued the public apology for it. I refused to go to school that Monday. It's very important to note that I have not been in school since Friday. On Tuesday, when my grandpa dropped me off, the drug-sniffing dog was at the school. However, as it was close to drug-free week, I thought nothing of it. My business teacher told me she'd seen the article in a local paper but that it looked like it had been staged. And if I got any crap for it, to let her know. I went to my locker as the officer walked out of the same hallway. But since that was the hall the principal's office was on, they didn't think anything of it. I noticed the locker standing completely open and when I got to it, I realized it was my locker. I blew up on the principal. I understand now that it's not my property and the school can authorize it being searched, but it was just nonsense. Why was I being searched? The principal says, no, you weren't searched. You must have left your locker open last night. Both my friends have their lockers next to mine and they have basketball practice until 4. They shut my locker if I leave it open. I haven't been here since Friday. Are you telling me that everyone in this school left a locker standing open for all of Monday? I called my mom and was pulled out of school for Tuesday as well. Ultimately, all charges were thrown out because of that marijuana plant. The chief of police put in his official report that it had been 8 feet tall. And when questioned about it, when they tried to press drunk charges on mom, he clearly said yes, your honor, it was 8 feet tall. The judge asked him when he found it and he said about 1 in the morning. <laughs> there really had been a marijuana plant that was 8 feet tall behind the 6 foot tall fence, he would not have needed to demand permission to search the property. The charges were thrown out. And that's where it stood for 10 years. Mom waited and played the long game because she wanted to make fully sure the statute of limitations ran out. She didn't want to give him any legal reason to retaliate against her. She waited and waited. Then, at the first town council meeting after the statue ran out, she made contact with one of the council members. In a small town, you don't screw with the council members. Everyone knows them and everyone listens to them. Or they do here at least. This was the head of the council too. And at the time, his grandson was my co-worker, so he knew of me and he liked me well enough since I worked for the largest business in our area. He listened to mom's story and told her that the last he'd heard, there was nothing in the evidence locker at the station at the moment, meaning none of the guns they had confiscated had been entered. And she told him most of them belonged to me and were basically family heirlooms they were. He nodded and asked her that if he could produce those guns, could she prove they belonged to us? And mom said she had a notebook of descriptions of the guns. There are serial numbers, serial numbers on the hunting rifles that had scoops 
and the two of them had distinguishing marks that were hidden from sight but she could find them and show them off. Because my mom loves having a paper trail on everything. And he told her she would get them back that Monday. We found out that he went to the station and told the same police chief that because they had never successfully charged us with any crime and that now the statute of limitations had run out, all the confiscated property had to be returned back over to us. But there was a rumor that the guns weren't in evidence. He would be in on Monday to have it checked. The police chief went bail. And on Monday, they were all in the evidence locker. However, one of them was missing a scope. It came out somehow that the chief of police had never intended to enter them into evidence and had sold them to his friends. He'd been thinking he got away with it for a decade until mom turned back up with proof that they belonged to her and legally had to now be returned. He had to go and buy back every single one of them, sometimes pay more than twice what he'd been paid because some of these friends had not been speaking to him for some time. And one of them had taken the scope off a while ago. He was immediately fired and arrested for it. And we got our guns back. Edit. For those wondering, mom did consider taking more drastic measures against the town for what happened. Especially as we did suffer harassment from people over it. However, her lawyer advised that we had gotten one of the best outcomes. Return of property and the corrupt police chief arrested. There was little else we could do. As for the Pratt, she never got her satellite TV installed as far as I know. She ended up selling the house and property anyway. And we bought it. It had originally been part of our property, but my great uncle had sold it years and years before. And we tore the house down. And now we have reached the end of today's stories. Thank you for watching and see you next time.